before I um, ask the children to go, there's this um, text that came into to me. It was sent to me, and I thought I would share it with you. At a time when the church has become a ground for entertainment, we need revival. At a time when a music minister competes and compares himself with secular musician, we need a revival. At a time when the altar of God is used for comedy, we need a revival. At a time when a successful minister of the gospel is measured by how rich he is and not how much impact he is making, we need a revival. At a time when passion for souls have been replaced with fashion parade, we need a revival. At a time when motivational speaking has replaced biblical preaching, we need a revival. At a time when you really cannot differentiate between a daughter of Zion and the woman of leisure, we need a revival. At a time when pastors kill each other for posting and higher position, we need a revival. At a time when modern preachers now tell us that Jesus is not coming soon, we need a revival. At a time when packaging and special effects have replaced the beauty of God's glory, we need a revival. At a time when the church does not know the difference between witchcraft spirit and the Holy Spirit, we need a revival. At times when filling the seats in our place of worship has become a priority than raising disciples of Jesus, we need a revival. And on and on and on. Cut, long story short, this is a time and a season where revival is very urgent. But it starts with the individual. It starts in our individual hearts. Because when you and I bring a reawakening in our hearts, and when we bring it together, guess what happens? There's a conflagration of God's power. And that is what we hope and pray for. That in ordinary life, such as yours and mine, God's power will be manifested. And this city and beyond will know it and be impacted by it. In Jesus' name. As the younger ones head to their church, I want you to please open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. You can sit, choir. Thank you. Thank you. Exodus chapter 32. Thank you. Exodus chapter 32. I want to use this opportunity to thank everyone that God has used one way or the other. Even in the three weeks that I was away, my joy is that this work is not the work of one man or one woman. It is the work of God. And I was so blessed as I logged in to be a part of the fellowship by live stream. I was instructed. I was very blessed. I was very happy. And I also want to thank those who didn't mind the fact that, oh, it wasn't pastor that would be preaching. And you came. Thank God for you. Exodus chapter 32. I'm reading very quickly from verses 1 to 11. Today I want to speak to you, the topic of my message is the seen but unseen God. The God that you do not see, the world, but the one who sees you. Hello sis, I was looking at the list of the current envoys, I was looking, I was, I'm still looking, I'm still looking. So tell my brother. All right? Esther. It looks good on you. (laughs) 
Now somebody is saying this naughty man is back again. <laughs> yeah. Wahala jam wahala. <laughs> when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, or that pastor delayed in coming back to holding forth, they took matters into their own hands. The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Obviously, the men were wearing earrings even at that time. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. They brought everything that they would bring in a normal service. They brought their offering, peace offering, burnt offering. They did everything as though it was the right thing that they were doing. But it wasn't. How do I know? Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I, have, which I commanded them, and they have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the hand of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. I want to speak to you today on the seen but unseen God. The one who is looking down. I, 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 sent, uh, I sent some clips to you while, last week Sunday. And I, I showed you one of the, the pictures that I was seeing because it, it is such a wonder for, 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 for me to be able to connect with you over such a distance. And it just set me thinking about so many things. If from one continent I could look onto another continent and be connected to you real time, real time, I saw the person who was just, you know, cutting their nails and another one that was sucking his thumb, another one, you know, just doing all kinds of funny things. And I said, is this person listening? Well, I thought you said my picture was available. I stood or sat somewhere thousands of miles, but I was seeing you. I recognized each and every one. The things you were doing that you were supposed to do and the things that you were doing that you were not supposed to do. It was so instructive. This account that I'm sharing with you is similar to what it is that God made possible. This was God on the mountain with Moses. Enjoying fellowship and God was saying to him, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to build the, ta the tabernacle. This is what I want you to do and this is how you're going to do it. The order of priesthood. God was mentoring him. God was one-on-one -on -one pouring himself into Moses that it might be of an advantage to the people. God was having an intense session with Moses. All that Moses could see was the intensity of God's presence. But God could see much more than that. God could see everything. God was there in the heavenlies, but at the same time he could see what the children of Israel were up to. I'm speaking about the seen but unseen God. The one who 
could not just see the body language, but could see the heart of the people. The one who could see when you cross your hand and say, what's this man talking about? I'm going to leave this place and still do the naughty thing I want to do anyway. Pastor might not see that, but God sees that. I shared with them on Friday another thought that God formed in my heart. If, for instance, Sister Larry has not met me before, and she was here last week, and I sent a little message, and Pastor Dukpe finished her message, and she was saying, oh, this is what Pastor sent to us, and she's reading the word of Pastor. If she has never met Pastor before, she has a choice, either to believe that it is true that these are the words of Pastor, or to believe that these guys are just fooling themselves. Maybe she just took it from somebody's book. Because she has not met pastor before does not mean that pastor does not exist. And a lot of people say that we are crazy or we don't know what we're doing or we're foolish because we choose to believe that Christ exists. And he sends us his word from where he is. And he sends us his thoughts from where he is. Now, if I can send you, as the, as the message was going on, and I was listening to what she was saying, and everything else that uh, everybody else had, you know, the, the, the scripture that uh, Deaconess Clara uh, shared with you, and the prayer points that uh, Deacon Jumble shared with you, and everything else, and I was on my phone, and I was sending, these are my thoughts, and I sent it to you the same way God still speaks today. But because we don't see him does not mean he does not exist. Now, wouldn't it be very silly for anybody to think, oh, no, you just created that figment of your imagination. There's nothing like pastor. He hasn't traveled anywhere. He hasn't reached you from anywhere. This thing is just something you received. I don't know where you received it from. Will that make that person wise or right? This is the word of life. And God communicates and still communicates with his people. It does not change that fact whether you, if you're visiting us or you're streaming us, whether you are just, how do you call it, seeking, whether it is by faith or no faith that has brought you in contact with us today, it does not change the fact that the word of God is true. Let me bring you back to my text. God, you can take this away. Take me back to Exodus chapter 32. God says in verse 9, I have seen these people. They do not realize that what they are doing and what they have done is an affront to me, but I have seen what they are doing and it is an annoyance to me. Moses said in verse 11, He besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? I want to contrast two positions for you. Are you still here? You are sure? Don't let me lose you. I want to contrast two positions for you here. In verse 1, the people said, Moses brought us out of Egypt and we don't know what has happened to him. In verse 11, Moses did not take the bait. Even when God himself said in verse 7, the people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Moses was wise enough to know, Lord, you did it, not me. You see, the people have a way of just thinking that their, their success and their promotion comes from their brilliance and the energy of their effort. There's a way in which man always wants, oh, the leader has to be there, somebody we can touch, somebody we can see. That's the reason why they, 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 they change theocracy for kingdom rule, for monarchical rule. They went up to Samuel, no, 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 God is not, you know, God is a leader, we know, but, you know, he's a leader we cannot see. Give us a leader we can see. The pivotal role that faith must continue to play in our existence 
an almighty God who knows and can do all things. We need him now more than any other time. In a time when life and living seems to be pointless and meaningless, the only thing that will make it make you stand and continue to stand is faith in a God who holds not just today but holds tomorrow. When he says it's your month of protection, that's what it is because he's going to protect you. When it's a time for divine promotion, that's what it is. And I shared with them on, on Friday, just as uh, John Boo was saying to you, divine promotion means that there's an element of the divine in it. And God is going to ask himself, why should I lift you up? Are you going to be like that woman who, of whom a, great, a lot of great good things were spoken about her? That, oh, she has been so helpful. She has helped our neighborhood, the centurion. He loved us and built us a synagogue. You must help him. He's worthy. Where is the divine responsibility on your part that is going to provoke divine promotion? Because the two things work together. The people could only see Moses. And even when God suggested it to Moses to prove him to see what was in his heart, Moses did not take the bait. Moses said to him, Lord, you brought forth these people out of the land of Egypt with your great power and with your mighty hand. It's you. It's not me. Many of, many of us still do not know the source of our power. We still do not know the source of our victory. We still do not know the source of our promotion. We are quick to forget who got us to that place of importance in the first place. You know, when God opens a door, that door is not supposed to consume you. His, his grace is supposed to give you the equipping to fit through that door of opportunity that he opens. My prayer is that that understanding will come to us today, anew and afresh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The entire story of Exodus, it happened. The experience of Exodus happened because of what God saw. You know, there's a way in which God will see your diligence. He'll see your commitment. He'll see your heart. He looks at your family and he sees a family that is sold out to him. He sees an individual that, you know, just wants to go all out for, for him. And he says, no, 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 no. I cannot but reward this fellow. And the reverse can be the same. That's why he says that there are people who, with, my, with their lips, they worship me, but their heart is far from me. He sees everything. Again and again, I try to encourage you that, you know, I don't want holding forth to just be about a religious gathering. I want it to be a place of relationship, not, not just with one another. That's a good starting point, but especially fellowship with the almighty God. That's the most important thing. A God that you have a relationship with, a God that you can, you can call upon and talk to and relate to, not out of fear, but out of love. The world is in a bad place, brothers and sisters. There's so much hardness of heart. I was teaching you recently about how the scriptures are being fulfilled that says in the last days it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. Very difficult. People wouldn't even know what, what does it feel like or should it feel like to be a Christian. But that shouldn't be our portion. Our portion is those that are rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not the word of man. I've, I've not come to explain to you, you know, seven steps to, you know, to how I made it or 17 steps to, you know, how I will continue to make it and 21 steps to how I will make it when I continue to make it and I've made it and made it. No, it's the word of God. This is the only thing that will keep us going. It's good for me, it's good for you, it's good for the world. And the world is doing everything in its power to make sure that, even when you hold a Bible, it is an empty Bible that you are holding. So it's not even enough to say, I come to church. It's not even enough to say, I, I'm holding the Bible or reading the Bible. It is about, do you understand what you are reading? The Ethiopian eunuch went for fellowship. There was a lot of 
singing and dancing and all kinds of things. But he was reading it, but he didn't understand it. God saw what was happening down. Moses didn't see it. But God said to Moses, you've got to go down and you've got to bring a message to these people because they have annoyed me. When the servants of God, the children of God, the messengers of God, when they mount this pulpit, is because God has seen something. God is seeing something and God wants to talk about that which he has seen or is seen. So don't, don't be angry with the messenger. Let the word do its entire work in you. Moses came down. He was so angry. He broke the, the tablets of God in his anger. Still, still this Exodus chapter 32. Verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, These people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. He's a, it's a, he's a fan, it was a fantastic shepherd. A great pastor, this Moses. Forgive them, Lord. And I know I mean something to you, and I know, and I, and I know you have a soft spot for me, but I'm prepared to say, blot me out of the book you have written. That's how much he wants, he cared so much for the people that he was leading. God had showed him and told him about what was happening. And he came down to correct it, bringing a word of correction to the people. Verse 33, the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever had sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. God is seeing us. And I appreciate, like, just like Dick and Tony said, I appreciate the way God precedes all of us. Whether you want to read the Bible, whether you want to take a prayer point, whether you want to lead the worship, God precedes all of us and he just gives us a thread that connects everything together. I had prepared with a scripture that um, um, Kalara read. I had looked into the... Um, passage that John Bull read in preparing for this message. And the prayer point he raised was an important point for us to consider. Lord, make me teachable. Because if God spends time giving me a word or giving her a word or giving any one of the, uh, um, those who minister here a word for us to benefit us and we do not change. God says, you go and play your role. Do what I've asked you to do. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them because they are without an excuse. They were warned, they were told. Exodus chapter 3. I want to read quickly verses 7 to 10. I am speaking to you about the seen but unseen God. Exodus chapter 7, sorry, 3, verse 7. And the Lord said, again, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. He looked down at our service this morning. And maybe there's someone sitting in one corner and, you know, that, that person, you, you just see that person looking radiant, looking good, looking, you know, but the heart is so heavy. And that person can barely lift up his eyes or her eyes, you know, and it's just like, Lord, this load, this weight is too much for me to bear. God is saying, I am seen. Be encouraged. Tough times. We're living through, 
I mean, how tougher can it be? Donald Trump is presumptive uh, uh, candidate. How, 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 how crazy can it, can it get? But that's just to show you that nothing seems to make sense anymore. I'm not saying vote for Hillary. But when the likes of Donald Trump, three times married, where is the model? Where is the example? Questionable business ethics. Where is the model? Now, it doesn't matter. For those people who have one wife, it doesn't mean that you know, they are all altogether clean, but at least it's one wife. <laughs> Things are happening, and for many of us, it is still business as usual. Again, should we stay in Europe? Should we leave? What do we know? What do we know? And, and, the, and, the, and the, the arrogance of people thinking that they know. Where is God in all of this? What is the church saying and what should we be saying? If God is the governor among the nations, what is the view of the governor? If he's the one who is head of your home, what is his impact and his influence and his role in your home and in your life? I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. I love the Lord. I love the heart with which he just wants to bless and bless and bless and bless and bless. On Sunday, on Friday, we were looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8. When he, when he was promising the children of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let me just go there quickly before I come back to, to my to. To my text. Verse 7, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. A good land. Not because the land was good before, but so long as he brings you there, he brings you there, it becomes good. Doesn't matter what it is that they have said about Milton Kings, just concrete cows. Your own will not be concrete, it will be living. So long as he's the one who is holding your hand, who is leading you and guiding you, forget about what it is that the forecasts have said. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, and a land of olive oil and honey, my God. You know, I underlined this one on Friday. I think you should do so too. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. My God. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and whose hills thou mayest dig brass. And God says, this is the land I want to bring you into. This is the promise that he made. Because he saw what they were going through and he decided he was going to do something about it. God said, this is your inheritance in me. Come now, therefore, verse 10, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, and thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. It was God, not Moses, that brought them out of Egypt. But like they got it wrong, we also, even now, still get it wrong. There is nothing that you and I do that is hidden from the sight of God. God sees and knows everything. But most times, even the best of us forget. That job, that contract, that little opening, it's not little because God is going to use it to take you higher. He saw, he's seen, and he has seen. Be encouraged. You remember the indiscretion of David? 
David orchestrated to get Uriah killed, and he took Uriah's wife. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 27, the Bible says God was very displeased with what David had done. Because he saw what David was doing and planning, all the subterfuge and, you know, and manipulation and sly things he was doing, God was seeing him. Same way he saw what you did this morning. Same way he saw what you did yesterday and last month and last week and last year. But the thing that David did displeased the Lord. God saw what David did and sent Nathan to him. Again, like John Bull told us, God reminded him, I brought you up from nothing. I saw you when you were just a little boy. I saw you on the day Goliath will have ripped off your head. I saw you when your, when your, your siblings and your, you know, when they wanted to keep you down and they were challenging you. What are you doing here? I saw all of that. But because my purpose was upon your life, I brought you promotion and increase. Are you cold? Is that a yes? Yes. You have to refund us the cost of this air conditioner. <laughs> Where is Tony? Tony, you have to re get a refund. If we had conducted a, a poll, these ones would have said, please don't put AC in this place. You have to be used to good things. <laughs> Praise God. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, very quickly, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, sharing this with you again on, on, on Friday, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, from verse 2 to 7. 1 Chronicles. We're looking at the fact that even the best of us, sometimes we forget that it is not our, our, our strength that accomplishes for us. And so we're using the example of David, the man that God loves so much, and even he himself, sometimes he let it slip, his understanding of who was in control. First Chronicles chapter 21, from verse 2, David decides to number the army of Israel. David said to Joab, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab knew that that which the king had commanded was wrong. The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? You know, there's a way in which you look at your ATM balance and you think, yeah, yeah, I think I'm cool. And you look at the new job that is the description of your employment letter and you think, oh, no, no, I've crossed the threshold now. I can never be poor again. There's a way in which all of this lie, we sell it and tell it to ourselves. And I'm trying to explain to you that even the best of us fall, run foul of, fall foul of this or fall victim of to this. David, even his number two man was telling him, sir, what you want to do is not a military decision, it's a religious decision. Because it has always been God, Jehovah Almighty, who is the commander-in-chief and the one who helps us in our battles. It has never been because of the size. It has been because of the mightiness of our God. But for one reason or the other, like you and I often do, David chose to look at his physical strength. Nevertheless, verse 4, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And he did what David the king had asked him to do. And verse 7 says, And God was displeased with this thing. The seen but unseen God, who was there listening in on the conversation that David was having with his second in command, it displeased him. How many times have that confrontation between husband and wife been displeasing to God? How many times has that confrontation between children and their parents been displeasing to God? How many times have the confrontation even in the church environment been displeasing to God? But my question is, why will a sane, rational, God-loving man like David, 
Why would he get involved in all of those things that led him from taking somebody else's wife, being consumed by lust, and now being consumed by subterfuge, and now being en engaged in murder? Why would a man like David, why would he end up a murderer? Why? Why will a God-loving, obedient man like David, why would he not take counsel of his trusted second-in-command, who, as the, as the voice of reason and as the voice of God, warned him? Why would he jettison all of that and still do something that was displeasing to God? Ask yourself, why do you do the things that you do that cause, causes and brings displeasure to God? I tell you why you do it. Because you forget that our adversary, the devil, is still very active. And I've showed you before that this chapter starts in verse 1 by saying, Second, First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1 says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. It has always been him that is behind all of this arrogance and haughtiness and pride in our hearts. And God is saying to us that if you want me to promote you, if you want me to elevate you, if you want a place of honor, it says the entry point is humility. That's the reason why he told us in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. He says, if my people who are called by my name, you remember that? Will do what? Before you pray, before you turn from your wicked ways, before you do anything else, he says you have to humble yourself. Humility comes, a, a, a man who is not humble, your prayer is even an abomination. It's unacceptable, not to him at least. So it starts with being humble. That is the entry point to anything else that we want, we want to be or can be in God. And he's seeing it. He's seen our false humility. He's seen our pretentious actions. He's seen when we are here, but we are not really here. He's seen when we give, but we really don't want to give. He's seen everything. You'll be amazed how, how, how arrogant and pride we really are. We are. So where do we go from here? God gives us a way of escape. And he gives us the example of Christ. In Philippians chapter 9, we see the example of Jesus there. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. Philippians chapter 2, we see the example of Jesus there. Philippians chapter 2. I just want to bring all of this together as we close. But I want us to, I want us to read this together actually. Just give me a minute to, to get to it. Because you and I can ask that question. So, Pastor, we've heard you. What do we have to do? We have to do it, the example of Jesus. Can we read it together, please? Philippians 2, we will read verses 1 to 9. Let's read. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Let's pause there because I want to underscore the importance of these last two verses, 6 and 7. We're talking about Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, although he was God, he did not equate himself to God. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. The example I want to give you as we celebrate the 90th birthday of Her Majesty the Queen, I want to give you an example of maybe one of her children. Can you imagine if Prince Charles, for instance, decides to dye his hair in a different color, you know, disguise himself, and decide that I'm going to Colombia or India just as a missionary? Totally disguised, no press call, no nothing. And he decides to go to the humblest parts of India, incognito, nothing to remind him or anyone of where he's coming from. Can you conceive it? Can you imagine it? When the Bible speaks of Jesus Christ and he says, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon, do, do you know what, what dignity? Do you, I mean, we're talking about God. We're not even talking about the sacrifice of leaving Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle and going to India. We're talking about leaving heaven. Who will go for us? There are some of us who would not even dare to go back to your home country, Ghana or Nigeria. Because you are so used to flicking the light and, you know, the switch and the light is there. And you are thinking, ah, if I go back to that place for one week, will I, can I survive? You cannot bring yourself to go back to your native country. But God Almighty, I'm trying to explain to you that humility is not what you thought it was. It's not. Some of us don't under, understand the concept of humility as love. Humility as service. Humility as submission. Humility as obedience. We don't understand that concept, but you and I will freely describe ourselves as humble. Because when pastor was coming in, you helped him to carry his Bible. I want you to imagine what Christ did for you. Do you think, don't even let us go as far as the royal, you know, royal household. There is a television series that has become so popular, Under, Undercover Boss. And so the, this CEO of a very large organization will pretend like he's just somebody looking for a job and he will go to his branches across the country and he will do manual labor with the other staff and he would you know, do all kinds of things. At the end of the day, they all bring him together. They bring them all together and he, he stands and he says, oh, this is who I really am. I'm the CEO. And everybody say, wow. And, you know, and he was loading with us and he was watching this with us. And you know, everybody's surprised because a man was loading with you. But we take God for granted every time. His presence is here with you. Always with you. He said, I will never leave you, you nor forsake you. You are never alone. It doesn't matter where you walk into. His presence is there with you. And the important thing is, you are so vital to him. He wouldn't choose anybody above you. It's not because you can pay him enough. It's not because you can serve him enough. It's not because you can love him enough. It is because he has chosen to love you. Imagine what he left 
because of you. That is the epitome of humility. It's not what you and I think it is. We, 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 tend, we think to ourselves that we have done too much by doing the little that we're doing. Let's read 6 to 9. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also, this is where the promotion comes in. This is where the promotion comes in. Having done all those acts of, humil of humility, God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. I said something on Friday, which I'm going to repeat here. I said God wants to lift someone up beyond even your own expectation. He wants to lift someone up beyond even your own expectation. That person can be you if you will be willing to humble yourself in the sight of God so that he can honor you, lift you up and honor you because that is what he said that he wants to do. Brothers and sisters, let's put away the old things. Let us do the new thing and the right thing. Let's grab God with both hands and be serious about our confession of faith. We have encumbered ourselves with too many unnecessary things. I share one story with you before I close. I went for a function because my nephew got married. And so we traveled for that function. And, you know, as is customary in Africa, especially in Nigeria, you know, you come out just because you, you've turned out in maybe nice clothing. You, people just surround you and they'll be singing and they ask you, oh, give us money, da, 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 da. So three women were praying singing and they don't know me from Adam, but they just thought this man should be able to give us something. So they were singing and, you know, oh, you have to have, you know, this and that, da, da, da. But I decided to give because you can see that they needed, you know, there's nothing wrong in being charitable. So I brought out some um, notes that I had in my pocket. There were three, three women and two people, two men on drums. So I gave some notes. I gave it to this woman. At least three or four notes I gave it to this woman, thinking that she was going to share it with her friends. <laughs> Believe me, she grabbed it, didn't say thank you, turned around, and ran. They came together, you would have thought that there was some form of association or, you know, or understanding or, or togetherness. Or, but as soon as the money touched her hand, she didn't even, the person who had been saying, oh, you know, God is going to favor you, you, you know, the successful man, I'm, Everything was just by rote. It didn't come from her heart. She grabbed the money, turned around, and she, I tell you, that thing, it was the most valuable lesson I learned in my three weeks away. She didn't even, didn't even say to herself, I've got four things here. Let me give one here. Let me give, I probably would have said, I see something in your heart. Let me give you more. But she ran. I now said to the others, I said, what this your colleague has done, is it right? But that's man for you. She had no, she had no empathy, no sympathy, no sincerity in her heart. She was just looking out for herself. I'm telling you, you needed to have seen the way this woman took off. I was very disappointed in humanity. But that's you and I. 
the Spirit of God began to speak to me about how we all are like that woman. No thank you is just grab and run. I put my hand in my pocket. I gave to the drummer. I gave to the second drummer. I gave to the other two women. I said, look, I want you to know that it is in your ability to recognize the need to be charitable that your liberation comes. We need to understand this thing. When the Bible says God loved us so much that he gave us, he didn't become poorer. He didn't. I want you to talk to God. What is your act of service to him? What will it be? What will it be? How are you going to demonstrate? I said, love is not what you say. It is what you do. There are many men who will say, oh, I love, I love, I love. And they, they, they leave the same house that they're saying I love. And they're heading for somewhere else that negates everything that they have said. Love is not what you say. It is what you do. What is the service that you will give to God that will speak of humility and it will provoke the promotion? God wants to lift up his people. But can you handle it? He's not going to give you something that will consume you. And I tell you, that is one of the reasons why Donald Trump cannot get there. Because he is not a, 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 a humble person. I've done the deal. I've done the deal. He thinks he is... I don't know whether there's going to be a third option. I don't know. But if Donald Trump gets there, then you and I have to know that the coming of the Lord is just weeks away. God hates arrogance because it reminds him of the wiliness of the devil. He hates it passionately. So if you are a child of God and you are in the house of God and nobody can talk to you, there are some people that you have to look at their face before you approach them. And you think that you are in the house of God. Is she smiling? Is he smiling? Let me use this opportunity to talk to her now before she changes her mind. Rise up on your feet. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Lord, I want the mind of Christ. I want the mind of Christ. Make me humble, make me teachable. The mind of Christ, let that mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The best of us, we fall on our faces just like David did. Because the enemy is still seeking for an opportunity to cause us to stumble and fall. The Bible says we should resist the devil and he will flee from us. God himself resists the pride, the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Without grace, we can do nothing. I want us to ask the Lord to help us. In those two examples I shared with you concerning David, you will understand why David was loved of God. As soon as the error of his ways was brought to his knowledge, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. I want you and I to ask the Lord, Father, forgive us. Sometimes we don't even know that, just as Fumi shared with us, we don't even know that we're not humble because our understanding of, of humility is distorted. It is possible for you to kneel before God and still be standing up on the inside. Have you obeyed the last instruction he gave you? What about the word that his son shared with you one year ago, one month ago, one week ago? How important are you taking it? 
Where's humility in your actions? Lord, help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to be more like Jesus. I want us to rededicate our lives going forward. Because I know that promotion will come. As surely as the protection came, I can tell you that divine promotion will, is coming. But humility is your responsibility. Pastor Alison, come and close us in service.